Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining me this morning are our analysts, Republican Phil Harriman and Democrat Betsy Sweet. Good morning to you both. Good, Good morning, morning, Zach. Hi, Hi Betsy. Nice to see you. Happy Phil. holidays. Same to you. <laughs> nice to see you. We want to start on the national level with that abortion case out of Texas. Katie Cox, the woman at the center of the case, has been forced to leave her home state to get an emergency abortion. The Texas Supreme Court ruled Cox did not qualify for an abortion under the medical exemption to the state's abortion ban. The attorney general there even threatening to take legal legal action against any doctors who offered her care. Betsy, this comes as the U.S. Supreme Court this week said it will take up a case on the abortion pill Mifepristone. Um, what does this mean for the country as a whole with this conversation? Well, first of all, my heart breaks for Karen Cox and her family. Um, and I think it's really important. It's tragedy, travesty and tragedy. I will say I think it's good for the country to watch this play out. So here's a woman facing a horrible decision. And any of us, anyone who's had a pregnancy or family or any, all of us can relate to someone who's that far along finding out this horrible news. And then to not be allowed to have, have a, a court and laws intervene in that very personal decision, which is heartbreaking for her. So she can't even stay with her other two kids and be as close as she can to home. It, it, this is what's going to happen. People are going to have to play hopscotch. And this is you know, deja vu all over again. This is what people had to do. Mexico, go to a different state, right, to access health care. This is wrong. And I think I'm, I think that the country is waking up over and over again to like what the actual realities of these kind of, you know, they may make good sound bites for politics and might create political divides, but damn, it is not good for human beings. And Phil, some are saying this will not be good for Republicans come 2024. I think all you have to do is look at what happened in Ohio in the <laughs> last election. They amended their constitution. Uh, to have the women's right to choose in a basically a, a red state. Um, you know, we, before the Supreme Court overturned or, or basically said Roe v. Wade is a state decision, not a federal decision, we had a myriad of different laws already on the books relative to abortion. What the Supreme Court did is just put a microscope on each individual state, and I think we could all agree uh, Texas is probably the most conservative, restrictive state in the country, but there are 20 which was, other... Which is why it was so important to have federal legislation and a Supreme Court decision that said, we don't have this hopscotch plan. But, but we did. We already had a hopscotch plan. I know, but, but then we changed it, and now they, they've gone backwards. Right. So now this is going to play out in each of these individual states. But as I said, Betsy, I think Ohio is a bellwether uh, Absolutely. for... Absolutely. Well, Ohio, Kentucky, I mean, there has the, not been a choice referendum on a ballot that is lost. Right. So it's not... Not good for Republicans <laughs> or yeah. anti-choice people anyway. Speaking of 2024, there was a hearing held Friday to talk about challenges to former President Donald Trump appearing on Maine's ballot. The Secretary of State says it received three challenges and each will need to provide evidence to invalidate his candidacy here in Maine. Secretary of State Shanna Bellows will rule on the challenges by December 22nd. So the clock is ticking here. Full transparency, though, um, one of those leading the challenges is political analyst Ethan Strimling, also uh, former Portland mayor. Phil, is this likely to act actually happen? I, I don't think so. As much as the proponents of keeping him off the ballot want to find him guilty of insurrection, he hasn't been found guilty of insurrection. So I don't know what the basis is. I mean, it's great political fodder. It rallies up the emotions of anti-Trump, but I don't think it gives the evidence that the Secretary of State, Shanna Bellows, would need to say he's not able to be on our ballot. Okay, so this is a little unprecedented, right? So we have someone who wants to uh -oh. be president. Uh -oh. Well, yeah. we have someone who wants to be president who has 92 felony counts against him. 92. 41 in federal and 41 on the state level. So, I mean, and I think ultimately he'll be on the ballot because, right, he will appeal it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court will certainly find in his favor, right? So, so ultimately it's not going to make a difference. But I think we have to step back and say, no, we don't know how this is going to actually turn out because it's never happened before that the person who wants to be the most powerful person in the world has 92 felony counts against him. And, alleged, and, alleged, and, and but, zero convictions. Well, because we, because our time a, because our time played out. I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. I, right, I, I I agree. I know they have nothing has been nothing has been decided. But if you had if you had a client who had said, oh hi, yeah, I want a job. I have 92 felony counts against <laughs> me. I haven't been convicted yet. Could I have a job? You'd say. Here's the door. Well, that's what the voters are there for. Well, I know, and that's hopefully what they'll do. <laughs> Mr. Two being together. <laughs> 
in New Hampshire, Republican Governor Chris Sununu is throwing his support behind presidential candidate Nikki Haley. It's a big deal for someone who is seen as a viable Trump alternative for the Republican Party. But Betsy, will that Haley appeal translate in Maine? Um, I think it might. I mean, I think depending on those 92 convictions, if any of them actually <laughs> happen, people are going to be looking for an alternative. And but I you think, don't think already there might be some yeah, no, 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 I think there's some appeal, appeal right now, absolutely. And I think people are looking for who is the alternative. And I don't think um, Santos, you know, DeSantos is the person that people are looking at. And I think she is coming up and she, you know, the debate that they had, everyone, a lot of the analysts said, oh, she did really, really well. So I think she, this helps her, boosts her as the alternative to Trump if people are looking for one, for the Republican alternative. Phil? Yeah, I think Betsy's got that uh, analyze exactly right. If if there is a reason why Trump is not there, she's the next uh, most viable candidate. And this may be a little too much political experience, but I think for Sununu to endorse Haley, we all know his uh, <laughs> disdain for Trump. So that wasn't like breaking right. breaking, breaking news. Breaking <laughs> news. <laughs> but in, in a in a unique political analysis, it's probably better for Sununu because if Nikki Haley does become the nominee and she does become president. He's probably got a cabinet position. Right, right. 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 <laughs> but I'm also curious, though, it, the appeal in Maine specifically for someone like Haley, those voters I, who supported a Joe Biden and a Susan Collins in the second district that can't stomach a vote for Trump again. Sure. Right. I, it, I think is so. That real? I mean, we, I look, look at our Margaret Chase Smith, Olympia Snow, you know, Susan Collins. You know, we have a history of um, the Republican Party has a history of nominating and, and Maine are supporting a strong female candidate. And I think, you know, she's she's the only one <laughs> on your side. Right. <laughs> All right. Back in. Washington. The impeachment inquiry into President Joe Biden gets the green light. The House voting along party lines this week in support of the process. Republicans are investigating whether the president and his son Hunter played a part in an influence peddling scheme, but they have not provided evidence to support that claim. Here's Hunter Biden himself on Capitol Hill this week. Let me state as clearly as I can. My father was not financially involved in my business, not as a practicing lawyer, not as a board member of Burisma, not in my partnership with a Chinese private businessman, not in my investments at home nor abroad, and certainly not as an artist. Bill, how does this end? Well, you know, I, I'm disappointed in Hunter Biden. He was there on Capitol Hill that day to testify behind closed doors with the House committee. He chose to ignore that and hold a press conference where he basically said this is all about mega Republicans, nothing to see here. Yet there's clear evidence of foreign transactions, traveling with his father to these countries, meeting these people that he ended up doing business with, not registering with a foreign as a foreign agent, not paying taxes on millions of dollars of income. Yeah, I think we do need to have an explanation. And if this is all about partisan politics, it should be pretty easy for Hunter Biden to prove it. Betsy. I don't think I could roll my eyes out loud any harder at all of this. I but, felt it. But <laughs> not what you said, not what oh. you said, but what is what, no, but what is happening. And I think, you know, I think one of the things, I mean, Phil, that he had a press conference before he went and talked to Congress. He didn't, I think go, he, he didn't go talk to he, Congress. I know, but who, but who, who was he taking his playbook from? His father? Do no, Donald Trump. <laughs> I mean, right? Who, who has a press conference before and after every legal proceeding? So, I mean, I listen. If you want to look at the Hunter Biden, look at Hunter Biden. But I think that the fact that they're trying to include the gov the president in this is just political gamesmanship, and it's like it's trying to say, hey, look over here, look at the silver bullet over here, because we don't want you to look right here. So, and I think now there's also information that the guy who's the, the congressman who's running the investigation might have a little shell game of his own going on. Um, well, so. that should all become self evident. <laughs> no, I know. I, no, we're supposed to be like, self-government. Our government is supposed to be agents that work for us. I know. They should I be agree. willing to put it all out there. Let's see it. I agree. We'll see. All right, <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. The Weekend Morning Report is back right after this. Good morning, everybody. I'm Zach Blanchard, and this is Political Brew. Joining me this morning, our analyst, Republican Phil Harriman and Democrat Betsy Sweet. Thanks for staying with us. You're Thanks. welcome. Absolutely. Good morning again. <laughs> Another cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we want to start with that big report out this week, essentially clearing deputies in Sagadahawk County of any wrongdoing when it comes to Lewis and Shooter Robert Card. This despite the fact they never made direct contact with him after repeated concerns from family and the Army in the months leading up to the deadly shootings. 
And Kurt's guns were never taken away, even though they put out an alert warning he was armed and dangerous and suffering from psychotic episodes. Phil, this all, of course, coming down to the yellow flag law. Um, if this report doesn't find any wrongdoing, does that mean the law itself is bad? I, I think at the end of the day, we have to wait for the rest of the investigation to unfold because this escalated to the state police and you know FBI and there are other dimensions to this. I think what I understand is this was an analysis of what the, the county sheriff's department did. And if there's a weakness, in my opinion, um, he, the, there's a red flag law in New York. That's when he was voluntarily in the hospital. That's when their law should have been implemented. I'm wondering if there's a, a sense of, well, he's leaving New York, we'll alert Maine. As the report indicates, the Maine Sheriff's Department did by protocol what they're supposed to accept. They never looked him in the eyes and, and determined whether all of the information they had, which clearly indicated this guy was a danger. And the yellow flag law should have been implemented, and it wasn't. And in fact, since this happened, the yellow flag law has been implemented, I don't know, more than a dozen times now already. Yeah. Yeah. Betsy. Well, I, I mean, a couple of things. <laughs> One is I think that we need to look at that report really carefully, because if you look at 99.9% .9 of the reports that are ever done on police misconduct in Maine, they never find any fault with the police. And I'm not saying that there is there, but I think to have someone who's so closely connected to law enforcement, you know, looking, you know, uh, looking at the, doing the review, I think it's a problematic. In terms of the red flag law and yellow flag law, the problem with the yellow flag law is that it is too cumbersome. You need a medical examination, then you need a psychological examination. The red flag law allows his family to go directly to the court, to a judge, and say, look, we're really worried about this guy. Someone please come take the guns away. And then the court says to the police, go take the guns. It doesn't have this whole long thing where medical, medical evaluation, uh, mental health evaluation, police getting involved, police deciding, making a judgment call. You don't have to worry about that with the red flag law. And the reason the red flag law didn't work in New York is because there was no family there to, to, to say, hey, he's dangerous, watch out, like, he, you know, because he didn't live there. And so I think, um, and then, you know, there's the uh, investigation with the armed services, what, what they did and didn't do, which is also a problem. But it also speaks to, you know, having services available for people who are released from mental health. You know, we don't have enough community services in Maine, and that's a whole different issue, but. I, I, only thing I would add to what Betsy said is those things did happen. He did have a mental health evaluation. No, I know he, he did. was I, No, I know he did. I know he did. They but, should but, have implemented the yellow flag law. But, but the mental health evaluation was by the Army in New York. Why well, should that matter? Well, in the yellow flag law, it does matter. It has to be someone. That's why it's so cumbersome. That's why it doesn't work as well as it should, because it has to be someone in Maine. They have to, you know, so that's, that's the problem and that's what we need to look at. And staying on this topic, Democrats from the State House, including Speaker of the House Rachel Talbot Ross, were at the White House this week talking about gun violence prevention. Here's some of what the Speaker had to say at the event with Vice President Kamala Harris. We have the opportunity in Maine to lead and to show the nation that we can make meaningful progress when it comes to gun safety. And Betsy, I know you have your ear to the ground in Augusta often. What legislation is actually being brought forward here in this next legislative session? Well, I think there's going to be at least four spe very specific things, and that's a red flag law, a 72-hour waiting period, an assault weapons ban, and then um, uh, the age of, you know, 18 to 21. So I think those are, we know, are, those are going to happen. Now, there's going to be ones that are more tweaking around the edges, but I think in terms of actually making a difference in Maine, not just the, the policy difference, but in terms of people's feeling of safety and people's feeling of like, what are we, after this tragedy, we better do something that's not just tweaking around the edges, but is actually significant, that's gonna actually bring some measure of safety to the people who have in, been incredibly traumatized through the whole state and certainly in that, you know, in that direct area. Bill, do you think any of these bills are likely to pass? I, I don't know. I think we're going to have to see the specific language of these bills. These are going to be very spirited debates. Debates. There are mm -hmm. strong feelings mm -hmm. on all sides of this issue. But I want to go back to your original part of the reason the question is before us is that uh, the Speaker of the Maine House, along with other members of the, our uh, legislative delegation, went to the White House. Good for them. I think we need to have more of these types of conversations, but they shouldn't be behind closed doors and they shouldn't be partisan. It was only Democrats who were invited to participate in this. That just sets us up as a 
a partisan discussion, and it's not. It's a main discussion. It is a main discussion. It should be bipartisan, but the people who were invited were people who have supported gun safety measures, and sadly... We all support gun safety Well, sadly, measures. no, sadly, in Maine, anyway, if you look at the voting record, there has not been support, bipartisan support for those measures, so that, I think that's part of it. We'll leave it there. Lewiston Mayor Carl Shaleen will keep his seat as mayor of Lewiston for a second term. After narrowly winning in the city's runoff election this week, Shaleen beat out his challenger John Connor by just 122 votes. Shaleen with 51% of the vote compared to Connor's 49%. And we should note that is with just 16% of the city's eligible voters turning out to the polls. Phil Shaleen's victory comes, of course, after the deadly shootings and, and growing calls for change in the city. Are you surprised he pulled out a win here? No, and I congratulate him. That was a very tough environment for an incumbent to, uh, to run for election and yeah. good, good for him. But as you pointed out, uh, don't overthink this election. It was razor thin. And the Lewiston City Council took a definite turn to the progressive left. They got rid of the three uh, conservative slash Republicans who met at a bar to have a conversation about the president of the council, right? And that backfired. So my point is this, uh, congratulations for being reelected, re but don't think the city has shifted all the way to the left. I don't believe it has. That's it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's... Uh I think I agree with you. It's a rough, was a rough time to do the. Just, it was a rough time to have an election. Um, I want to just make a plug. Had they had ranked choice voting, they wouldn't have gone from almost forty percent people electing this person to sixteen percent. You know, it was what six hundred people in Lewiston. You know, that that's not. I don't think that's a referendum on anything. I don't think it, we can tell he's razor thin. We can't say it. They moved to the left, to the right. That I don't think it's. I think it's meaningless. So please, Lewiston, adopt ranked choice voting. But but I think. I mean, really, they would have been over on election day. So and and more of the people who they really wanted would have come through. So, um, but I think it's. I mean, I think Lewiston has a long road of repair ahead of it. And I think the most important thing, and I think he has committed to this. The mayor's committed to this, as well as his opponent, is to bring people together because we got to stick together to get through this tough time. Absolutely. Shifting gears, there is some backlash to the IRS moving to tax energy relief checks. You might remember getting those $450 <laughs> checks. They were mailed out to thousands of us between January and March. Uh, the Maine Department of Administrative and Financial Services says the IRS told state officials the checks will be subject to federal taxes, but the department says that goes against earlier guidance. Betsy, the Mills administration really going to bat. Who messed up here? Well, I think the federal government messed up. I mean, they... they it's like, I'm sorry. It's like, oh, here we're the government. We're here to help you. Oh, whoops. No, we're not. You know, like, I mean, it's just, it just is absurd that we would give relief checks. Relief is the name. And then say, oh, we only get part of that relief because now we're going to, now we're going to put some hardship on you. I think, um, I think it's a, a mistake because the IRS had said earlier the heating assistance um, and relief was not taxable. So I think, I don't think it was us. I don't think it was the state that messed up. I think it's the feds. And I think we'll find that, in fact, this will not get taxed. Bill? I, I think Betsy's absolutely right. Right? But it's a it's a perfect example of when legislation is done behind closed doors uh, that created this relief mm -hmm. in the first yeah. place that some bureaucrat, unelected, unappointed, didn't put in language that says this will be well, non-taxable. Well. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this conversation if they did, right? Right. <laughs> All right, let's wrap things up with winners, losers. <laughs> Phil, we'll start with you. Uh, I'm sorry to say this. My loser of the week is Hunter Biden, who should have taken the opportunity to go testify behind closed doors. Instead, he used it as a chance to make a grandstand press conference blaming Republicans for the challenges he's facing. Uh, my winners of the week are all the ratepayers in, in uh, Maine. Uh, CMP is dropping electric rates. Well, <laughs> the provider of electricity, yeah. shall I say. They like it, to make the difference. Yes, yeah. they do. Important. So I will too. <laughs> the yeah, energy not, provider not. <laughs> is dropping rates significantly. Good for us. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because your winner is my loser of the week, which is <laughs> CMP and Versant, who went to court this week to overturn the referendum that we just voted on with the highest percentage of victory of any referendum in Maine history. The question number two, the one with 86% of the vote, they waited, what, less than two weeks to go in and to, and to um, file suit, uh, CMP and Versa and Maine Association of Broadcasters, Broadcasters. So they're my loser of the week, like read the room. Um, and the winner of the week is actually all the amazing people in Maine who I'm seeing who are coming together to donate toys and clothes and food to help people during this holiday season who don't have enough. And um, the generous heart and the care that we have for each other is really on display right now. I hope it stays on display all year, but it certainly is a beautiful thing to watch. Yes, and you can continue to donate to our Coast and Toys for Kids drive, by yes. the way. Awesome. Thanks so much to you, you both. Good to see you. The Morning Report is back right after this.